The Corsican Brothers, from the novel by Alexandra Dumas. When Madame de Franchi learns that her son Lucien is in the hands of her hated enemies, the Gadici, she and Griffo plan to bribe a servant in the household to effect his escape before the dreaded flogging is to take place. However, this servant reveals the plot to Dino Gadici himself, and he, in high glee, rushes to his brother Pietro and Marianne, his daughter, and tells them that now the entire family of the de Franchi will be wiped out, as they have now placed themselves at their mercy. It's wonderful news, Dino. At last. After all these years, the de Franchi have been elusive. It was many years ago when my father was alive that we thought we had the whole of the de Franchi at our mercy to escape. Madame de Franchi and, and Lucia. Yes. And now Madame herself walks into the lion's mouth. Below the waterfall. <laughs> Very daring of her. Perhaps she would risk anything for her son. How did Lucia find out? She was approached by Griffo, who's been with the de Franchi all his life. She's been bribed, and uh, <laughs> cunning old hag, she took the bribe. <laughs> but wasted no time in coming to you. Eh? <laughs> no time at all. <laughs> and so at last they deliver themselves. It'll be good to catch her alive, this proud mother of his. To let her witness the flogging before she too loses her life. Isn't it enough to kill them outright without all this torture? Enough? Have you forgotten what the first of France she did to us centuries ago? There is a stain there which can't easily be wiped out. Only with a full vengeance such as this. What are the details? Madame de Franchi and Griffo are to wait at the waterfall at midnight tomorrow night. The old hag, Lucia, when the house is quiet, will guide Lucy and de Franchi across the rose garden to the little gate in the wall, and thence along the track down into the ravine where the waterfall flows. They'll be waiting with horses, ready to take him off. Uh, the impudence of the de Franchi is to think that they could bribe one of our servants. Yeah, the old hag has acted wisely in accepting the bribe and then coming to us. Of course. We could not have planned a more perfect counter ourselves. <laughs> the gods of justice smile on us at last. Louis has gone. The house seems empty. Aye, madame. And with Louis leaving us so suddenly, it seems almost as though Lucien were leaving us. Madame, even to the last, when he waved his hand as he rounded the bend in the road going towards Iaccio, you know, I had the queer feeling here inside me, the, the feeling that it was indeed Lucien and not Louis who was leaving us. Mm. And yet there is a difference. Louis is the refined counterpart of Lucien. Oh, but Lucien is a gentleman, madame. A gentleman at heart. Oh, you've not seen what I've seen. Why, when we're in the marketplace or in the yaccio, Lucien is always courteous. Deferential to women, respectful of strangers. Uh, well, <laughs> except perhaps of Monsieur Godet on that day when the Monsieur mistook him for Louis. It is as though the boys were one with a dual nature. And yet, Griffo, we each of us have a dual nature. The primitive and that which man glosses over with culture. Always though the primitive lies dormant, ready to break the bonds. For Louis is quiet, boy, gentle. But if he were aroused, the storm would be let loose. The storm that we have seen in Lucian. Uh, yet he does not share the deep hate that his brother has for the Gadici. It is in the blood. It needs only to be nurtured. And uh, would you have it that way, madame? I hid this other son of mine in France so that he would not fall to Gadici knife. It seems now if they'd learn of his existence, they will seek him just as they seek my other son, Lucian. As it is. Both boys are in trouble now. Oh, perhaps you worry over much, madame. It may not be treachery as far as this Parisian woman is concerned. I've heard Louis speak so often to the beautiful Mademoiselle Latouche. 
Perhaps this litter he received was, was that of a mischief maker. Hmm? Where the smoke rises, there is always burning, Griffo. And Louis, he is such an impressionable boy. It is always the woman, always in love. Oh, not always, madame. There are some women some can trust. Oh, I did not mean that, Griffo. What I mean was that woman is the dominant factor in the life of every man. Take Louis. I made him. He came from me. I was woman, the source. What happens in his life? From me, he goes to a woman. Woman who weaves a spell around him. Aye, those are two words, madame. It's the pattern of life, from woman to woman. Sometimes the spellbinder is good, sometimes she is bad. With Mademoiselle Latouche, somehow I fear now that all is not right. Poor Louis. His pain, his agony will be even greater than that of Lucia. There is no torture worse than the mental torture of disillusion. It would break him, madame. It would kill him. Oh, madame, I've watched his eyes when he talks of Amelie Latouche. Lights come into them, lights of adoration, of worship. Oh, no, madame, he could not be mistaken. If men only knew, woman is their life. Woman at the beginning, woman on the threshold of their manhood, and a woman to make or break before the last curtain. I will pray, Griffo. I will pray for Louis. And for the goodness of his woman. And I shall pray for Lucien, madame, and for the success of her plan. <laughs> Why, he at least is for you women. There's not one on this island of Corsica who is fit for the master of this house. Mm, it happens suddenly, Griffo, this attraction, this affinity which men call love. It happens when we least expect, and when the flame is lighted it cannot easily be extinguished, except when he who lives dies. Then he has no feeling in this world. He rises or falls to another plane. Meanwhile, in the Gatici household, there was an undercurrent of excitement. The civilized world outside Corsica perhaps would not be able to understand what the eradication of an enemy in vendetta means to the Corsican. Marianne was the only one who did not share the excitement. Rather did she brood, speak scarcely at all, and lock herself in her room for hours. On the next morning, the morning of the day when the great plan was to mature, Marianne sat at her window looking into the walled-in rose garden. For two hours she'd been watching the door of the room where Lucien de Francia had lain so near death. Suddenly the door opened, and old Lucia assisted Lucien to the terrace. He was able to walk with difficulty, and soon he was settled in a chair in the sun. Sitting on the wall on the opposite side, squat-legged, was a Corsican, gun in hand, the guard. With a quick, decisive movement, Marianne suddenly rose from her chair, ran down the stairs and along to the guard. She gave him a trivial message for her father, who was up in the vineyard. Looking quickly through the tangle of rose bushes, she saw that Lucia had gone. And now we find her slowly walking through the twisted path which led to the terrace. As she came into view of the man sitting in the chair... He stared at her directly without flinching, no expression on his face. She reciprocated and finally stopped, standing directly in front of him. Well? Well, what? You're feeling better. Am I? You must be, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting out here in the sun. What a lot of trouble to take for a man who is condemned to death. There is a reason for the trouble. A payment for past insults, humiliations. Perhaps. Well, why do you stare at me? Where else am I to look? Where else could I look? You... You, you have everything you want? I have. Now. That doesn't sound like a condemned man. You don't sound like an exultant captor. Well, I am. Do you hear me? I am. If you have everything you want, I'll, I'll go. If you go, all that I want will be gone. Don't say that. Oh, it's true. And you know it's true. No, please, no. I knew you'd come. You never sent for me. But I knew. Why didn't you send for me? Why didn't you ask? I thought they'd guess. Guess what? Does it need any telling? Does it need any words to say what's between you and me? 
could any words possibly describe? Oh, Marianne, ever since that first night in the past, from that moment to this, I haven't been able to get you out of my mind. Oh, Lucian, it's useless, it's useless. We're enemies, mortal enemies. Your family and mine have murdered each other, cut each other's throats, and soon... Soon... They... What? Soon there is to be another. What do you mean? What are we to do? What can we do? It rests with you, Marianne. What did you mean when you said that soon there was to be another? Your mother. They know everything. You mean... Oh, the old hag, Lucia. No doubt she's told you what has been planned. Yes. What she also told my father. A trap will be laid. Marianne, do you love me? God forgive me, but I do. Then prove it. Oh, Marianne, let them kill me if they will, but my mother. Oh, please, Marianne, do something. Do something. A despicable act when my own family judged me. Yes, but if you really feel as I feel... I do, I do. Oh, Lucien, even before I came here, I knew that I would do it. I will set you free. I will have your mother warned. But when you go, keep away. Please go out of my life forever. To love a de Franchi is the greatest shame, the greatest dishonor that could ever befall me. I'll help you. I've no option, Lucien. Oh, Marianne. But I despise myself for doing this. I despise myself. Oh, please don't talk like that. But I do. I dishonor my family name. You're a de Franchi, our most hated enemy. I'm not your enemy. Your blood fights mine. But this time, well, you let me go free in the past. I leave in the score. But my mother... I know what can be done. Your mother will be waiting for you at midnight, down below the waterfall. I shall come to your room at eight, perhaps a little after. I will lead you outside, where there will be a horse to take you down the mountain trail. What arrangements has your father made? The old woman was to lead you down the mountain trail. But my father and brother were going to follow you. More of the family were to be posted on the other side of the river, so that you would be hemmed in. You, your mother, and your friends. Instead, you let us go free. Oh, Marianne, I've found my true love. Someone who returns it. Someone who doesn't hate me as I feared. You knew that I didn't hate you. You must have known. Your actions never told me. And yet... Oh, yes. I knew you'd come to me sometime. Oh, if only I could put my arms around you now. If only I... I... Let go of my hand, sir. At any moment, the guard will be back. I sent him to my father on a trivial errand. If we were seen like this... Oh, I want you, Marianne. I want to hold you close. Oh, don't talk to me like this. Everything between us must be forgotten, do you understand? Oh, Marianne. Everything. When you ride away this night, you must forget that I exist. Oh, how can I forget the Gadici? How can I forget Marianne Gadici when I'm told that she is my worst enemy? When instead I want to cry out in defense, I want to tell my mother, tell the world that she is the loveliest creature that ever drew breath. Don't you forget it. You're making me cry. Oh, Marianne, I mean it. And you know I mean it. Don't look up. Not like that. Somebody comes. Somebody from the end of the Rose Garden. Perhaps it's the guard. Perhaps it's my... Oh, why, it's my uncle. And that will be our final triumph, do you understand, Pink? I will be glad when this garden and this house is free of the pestilence, which is you. Marianne. Oh, uncle, it is you. I have just been telling this, how the Gadici treat their enemies. Marianne, don't you realize it is dangerous for you to be here alone with him? Where is the guard? I sent him on an errand to Father out in the vineyard. Don't you worry, I have a dagger. All the same, And I... this can hardly walk, so he tells me. It is only the Gadici who stand up to wounds. We are strong in body as well as in heart. Oh, the guard has come back. There is no need to wait any longer. The sooner I'm away from here, the better. I will come with you. Uh, Marianne, you take this to heart, don't you? And why not? Hmm. I think I can understand. Ever since you were a small child, the hate of the de Franchi has been instilled in you. And tonight... Tonight, the de Franchi will be no more. A penny for your thoughts, Louis. Um, Amelia, of course. Cheer up. It mightn't be as bad as you think. Oh, it's not bad at all. Not as far as Amelia's concerned. 
she must have an enemy, an implacable enemy. Somebody who wants to do her harm. Somebody who wants to do me harm. Pierre, I, I'm head over heels in love with Amelie. The poets and the writers say that love's blind. Well, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. But you, you're an outsider. What do you think of Amelie Latouche? Well, well, don't shrug your shoulders. Tell me. Well, Louis, it's a hard question. I'm not quite an outsider. I'm your friend. Amelie's a very beautiful girl. Perhaps one of the most beautiful in Paris. Her position, social position, is high. Her parents haven't much money, so they'd naturally be anxious to see marry money. Are you suggesting that because I've been disinherited... Pierre, how can you say such a thing? Oh, I've said nothing. You asked for a candid opinion. It's just a theory I have. Perhaps Amelie... Oh, sorry. Perhaps her parents have taken a hand. You must understand, Louis, that you're not the wealthy young man that you were three weeks ago. But I have means. Oh, yes, but Amelie flies high. She dresses in very good taste, but beyond her father's means at the moment, I should say. And perhaps her family might be encouraging a friendship with... Uh, with this Captain Reno. Have you ever realized, Pierre, the power there is in, li in a little white envelope? It can bring joy and happiness. It can bring stark tragedy, tears and doubt. And it's brought doubt to you? Doubt, yes. But not of Amelia. She'd never doubt me. Never. Nor I her. But there's someone who's jealous of us. Someone out there across the water who wants to separate us. Do you know what I'm going to do when I go back? No. What, Lou? I shall marry Amelia straight away, and that'll settle everything. That'll tie us together so that we'll be inseparable. And all the malicious tongues, the lying letters will come to no... And so the ship ploughs its way through the choppy seas toward the coastline of France leaving behind the Corsica of the de Franches with its tangle of mountains, its valleys, its basins and its gorges and ravines and tumbling granite hills. And as darkness closes in over the southern end of this island, lights wink out in the little village which surrounds the great house of the Gadici. First they were pale and watery, and then as the gloom increases they become bright, dotted all over the hillside from the houses which rise tier above tier on the steep crags of the mountain. After supper, Marianne is brighter than usual, but there is a brittleness in her talk with her father and her uncle, who soon retire to their bedrooms. When the great living room is empty, Marianne slips silently along the great hall and down the steps to the terrace. Lucien de French's door is locked, but Marianne has possessed herself of a key. She thrusts the great iron key into the lock and turns it slowly, quietly, looking round her fearfully, lest the noise be heard by the guard who sits on the wall opposite, his figure just a vague silhouette against the stars. Only two words are spoken in the darkness. Come quickly. A slender hand slips into his as she leads him along the darkened terrace towards the small gate in the wall. This is the greatest danger, the gate. It's not very far from the guard. You have the key? Yes, but it might take some time to turn without making a noise. Creeping along the twisted path from among the rose bushes, the two gain their objective, the gate. And when the key is inserted, there is five minutes of tension. As Marianne exerts the pressure just a little, just a little more, as she twists the key in its rusty, squeaky keyhole. But at last the job is done, almost noiselessly, and successfully, since the silhouette of the guard never moves. And soon they're outside the wall and creeping along the path. When at last an appreciable distance has been put between the two of them and the house, Lucien speaks. We've made it. Not quite. Should someone come to your room, the alarm will be raised. Oh, I'm outside. They'll never get me now. You seem to forget, Lucien, that you are weak. But I can manage a horse. You said there was a horse. Yes, we haven't far to go now. You understand clearly what you must do. Follow the trail. Oh, how can I in this blackness? I don't know this country. Leave that to the horse. I picked him specially. He knows every nook, every cranny. And if you keep his head away from the house, he'll take the trail to the waterfall. There your mother will be waiting. Oh, there. Yeah. The horse. Oh, Marianne, I can hardly believe it's true. Here I am free. And who has freed me? You. The one person who has been in my thoughts ever since that first night in the gorge. Yes, Lucia. It was moonlight then. Bright moonlight. 
And your face, as I always thought afterwards, was like a pale blue mist. And tonight? Tonight, it is a shadow. Something indefinable. But I can see your eyes. I can hear your voice, soft, low, musical. Oh, Marianne. Go, go now. Before I go, there is something I want to do. To hold you in my arms, to press my lips to yours. No. Please. It may be the only memory I'll have. The only memory. Yes, Lucien, you're right. It will be a treasured memory for me. Because after this, we shall never meet again. Marian, why is it like this? Two people so much in love. So much made for each other. We are enemies, Lucien. Standing as we are, so close together. So close that I can feel your breath on my cheek. Your arms held tightly around me. We each dishonor our name. Don't you understand, my loved one, my darling? Oh, Marianne, there must be a way out. None, as you well know. This is goodbye. Kiss me and go quickly. Oh, Marianne. Oh, don't cry, sweetheart. I'll pray every night, every night of my life, that there'll be a way out. Go. Go. Forget me. As I will pray that I will forget you. It must be like this. Goodbye, my heart. my heart. Yes. That is what I say, too. My heart is gone with Lucien. All that remains is a body, skin and bone and blood. The blood of his enemy. The condition. <laughs> There is a strange turn of events in the lives of Marianne Gedici and Lucien de Franchi. Each belongs to a family which has hated the other through centuries. And now that Lucien is prisoner and is to be flogged by the Gedici, Marianne realizes that she is overwhelmingly in love with him. So when her father hears of a plot to effect his escape and plans to trap Lucien's mother as well, Marianne sets Lucien free earlier on the appointed evening so that he can warn his mother and escape with her back to the north of Corsica. After Mariana has released him from his room and taken him across the scented rose garden through the little gate in the wall and down the rough, twisted path which leads to the gorge and to his horse, she finally bids him a fond farewell. She tells him that this must write finish to a love that is hopeless, which would be regarded as a dishonor by both families since they are hated enemies. And so we find Marianne straining her eyes in the darkness which has enveloped her lover, Lucien, and his horse. Goodbye, Lucien. Goodbye forever. Slowly and wearily she turns and walks back along the path towards her father's great stone house. But her thoughts are still with the rider and his horse which picks its way sure-footedly in spite of the darkness down the steep, tortuous path which leads to the waterfall. Soon, Lucien passes the waterfall. It was here at twelve o'clock that he was supposed to have met his mother and Griffo. It was here that at twelve o'clock the Gadici had arranged to trap all three of them. Now, however, if he follows the path further along for several miles, he will meet his mother and Griffo, intercept them, and they will escape. Soon, a new moon climbs out over the horizon. And as miles separate him from Marianne and the old stone house, he begins to wonder if destiny has planned that they shall ever meet again. Suddenly, from out of the darkness, there is a voice. Stop! Don't move! Put your hands high in the air! Is there any need? Huh? Why, why, that voice! Lucian! Is it really you? Yes, Griffo. <clears throat> but I, I don't understand. Well, we were to meet you at midnight. It's not yet half past nine, and... If you had met me at midnight, Griffo, that would have been the finish for you and my mother and for me. Where is she? Where is madame? She has drawn a horse back there in the trees. We were on our trip along this path to the waterfall there to await for your coming. Then we heard the sound of your horse. 
we thought that you might be a scout of the Gadici. Well, all I can be thankful for is that I didn't fire. I knew that I'd meet you along the way. Now, quickly, quickly, Griffo. Let's go to my mother. She'll hear our voices. She'll wonder what's happening. Mother. Mother. It's all right. She's heard you. <laughs> She'll be as surprised as I am. This, this talk of yours, Lucien, what was to happen if we had met you at the waterfall? It would have been a trap. The old woman, Lucia, she told the Gadici everything. Ah, the cheat. The liar and the cheat. I paid her to help us. Mother. Lucien, it's you. You. Oh, Lucien. Oh, Mother. Oh, what does it all mean? I'll tell you as we ride. We mustn't waste a minute. As soon as they've discovered that I've escaped... Oh, but... Lucien, you're alive and well. Yeah, as well as I could expect, I suppose. But I must warn you, Mother, that I can't gallop all the way. You were wounded. Oh, yes, but if we take our horses at a quick trot, I think it'll be safe enough. After all, we'll have had four hours start. And I know an untried way, a way by which they'll never find us if they wanted to follow Lucien. Ah, oh, good for you, Griffo. Oh, it's wonderful to be back with you, alive, safe and well. Oh, so much has happened. So much has happened since you have been away, my son. There is a tremendous surprise in store for you. Surprise? Yes, but it is dangerous to wait here. We must be on the move. Later, when we reach home, I will tell you everything, my son. Everything about you and Louis. Louis? It will keep, my son. Griffo, you lead the way and hurry. <laughs> Meanwhile, Marianne, with beating heart, opened the little gate in the stone wall once again and stole through the perfumed rose garden to the terrace, then up the steps to her own room. There she sat listening to the great clock in the hall chime the hours, the quarter hours and the half hours. As each hour sped by, confidence ebbed back into her being like the tide slowly enveloping the shore of an island. Each hour meant so many more miles between herself and her loved one. Then suddenly, from down in the courtyard, there came a cry. The cry was repeated again and again, and soon there were a babble of voices. The escape of Lucien de Franchi had been discovered. But still Marianne sat in the deep, low chair near her bed, her mind lingering on the memories of the last tender farewell with Lucien. Then suddenly the door burst open, and her uncle Pietro was standing framed in the doorway. Marianne, you have heard? What? Terrible the old... Frightful news. He's escaped. Who? The, the Franchi. By some inexplicable, extraordinary means, Lucien de Franchi escaped from his room. Indeed. Everything was in readiness for midnight. The old hag, Lucia, went to the room a few minutes ago, ready to lead him to the waterfall, where in the last half hour some of our men had been posted. And to her amazement, she found the room empty, although the door was locked. Your father is a raving madman. I'm not surprised at that. None dare to go near him. Lucia is in fear of my life. Look, listen. There he goes now. Can you hear him? I can hear him. Cussing and storming at everybody and everything. Ah, it's a cruelty, a torture, Marianne. To think that we had this to fancy in the hollow of our hand that we could have killed him outright like that. We didn't do it. Now he is free once again. He and his mother and the other one free to cut our throats if they get a chance. No, curse him for the cunning and shrewdness that he showed. Oh, there's your father storming again. Now oh, come down to him, Marianne. You are the only one who'll be able to pacify him. Foaming at the lips, I fear that a fit will seize him if he's not quietened down. I'm not going. You're, you're not? No, I, I prefer to stay here. I... I just do not want to go. I don't blame you for not wanting to face your father, but... Why, Marianne, this doesn't seem to affect you at all. Nothing does now. Not ever will again, Uncle Pietro. Storms, floods, fires, my father's wrath, wild beasts, death, hunger, cold, hate. None of these things mean anything to me anymore. Everything is meaningless. Marianne, this is not you talking. No. It is not Marianne. Marianne doesn't exist anymore. Uh, my dear, you've not been yourself for days and days. You're depressed, moody. And now, this new mood of yours, you, you need a change. Change would make no difference. Because everything is the same from now on. Leave me, Uncle Pietro. 
I would rather stay up here alone. You go to father. Look after him. He'll get over it. Yes, but you... Leave me, please. It doesn't make any difference that this hated enemy of ours has escaped. I've forgotten him. And yet a few days ago, your fury against him, your hater, shall never forget it. I'm surprised you're not as upset as your father. Perhaps it's because I'm not Marianne Gadici any longer. Please leave me, Uncle. Go to father. Now, as you say. I'm not a woman any longer. How can I be a woman when my feelings, my emotions, my heart, my very soul have been torn out from me, taken away, taken across Corsica, far away to the north, while I, the Cadeva, the shell, exist here in the south. It's so lovely to see you. Oh, really, you overwhelmed me. But I've been so bored. And when Mama arranged with your Mama that you could spend a whole week with me here at home... Oh, Annette, I'm so glad that you've come. Why? I need you. I need you terribly. I knew it. Your Papa has spoken to you about this Captain Chateau Renault. How did you know? Well, after all, you've been outrageous in me. It's a wonder he didn't speak to you before. Many tongues are wagging all over Paris. You seem to have entirely forgotten that you're betrothed to Louis Prevost, who's gone off to Corsica. Oh, him. I wish he'd stay in silly old Corsica. Oh, Annette, you've no idea how fascinating Paul is. His voice, the way his arms still around you. Really? And when he kisses you. Don't be disgusting. Disgusting? What's disgusting about it? It's all disgusting. The fact that you're allowing this man to make love to you. You're saying that because you don't like him. Because he made a joke about you. I'm not. Yes, you are. But please forget any dislike that you might have in it. Think only of your cousin and the fact that you can help her. Meaning that I can help you? Yes. It's quite true what you said. Papa called me in. Somebody has told him that Captain Chateau Renault and I have seen a great deal of each other. Papa, of course, is very fond of my fiancé. Papa has told me that I must not see Captain Chateau Renault again. But how can I help? Tonight we retire early. After we retire, Annette, I want you to say to Mama when she comes to kiss me goodnight that I'm already asleep. I want you to say to any of the servants who might come that I am not to be disturbed. Oh, that's why I'm so glad you're here, so that you can help me. What are you going to do? Don't tell me you're going to receive Captain Chateau Renault in your boudoir. No, Annette, but we have it all arranged. I'm going to elope with Captain Renault. Does it surprise you? I'm almost speechless. So was I, after I made the decision yesterday. You only planned this yesterday. Yes, Captain Chateau Renault persuaded me. Of course, he's asked me to elope before, but I've refused. But last night, somehow, when his arms were around me and, and his face so close, his voice whispering in my ear, and when his lips were on my cheek, whether it was the madness of the moment or, or whether it is Annette that I'm in love, really in love for the first time in my life, I, I don't know. But here I am today, planning to elope with Paul tonight. Well, you're crazy. I don't think so. He's so fabulously rich, even richer than gossip says. I'm to have a long, ermine cloak when we reach England. England? You're going to England, yes, just for a few months, until the scandal dies down. Then, when people have forgotten, Paul will come back and beg my father's forgiveness. I'll be waiting it too long, perhaps outside too long on one of his ships. When Papa realizes that Paul can buy me anything in the world I want, he'll forgive me. How can you dare do such a thing? For oh, love, and you want me to help you? Yes. All you have to do is to stand guard for the night, just to give Paul and I time to reach too long on his ship. Once we're on the high seas, we're safe. But you will marry... You must get married. Oh, of course. It's a preacher at too long. Paul has arranged it all. Oh, Annette, I'm so excited. My heart, and my spirit, my very being is soaring high in the heavens like a bird. I go higher and higher. And then I look down and down. And like the bird, I, I see a panorama of my life as it will be. Clothes, jewels, town coaches, country coaches, travel, and more important than anything else. Paul, strong and handsome and big. I won't have anything to do with it. Oh, Annette, please. I'll do anything for you if you'll help me. I'll even find you a husband. That's what you said when Captain Chateau Renault came to town, before you started taking an interest in him. You said he would make a husband for me. But you're not jealous. Surely you're not jealous. You don't like him. If you don't help me, Annette, we'll never be friends after this. 
And when I come back to Paris with Paul, when everything has been forgiven, and I'm the mistress of a huge mansion, you shan't be invited. If you don't help me, you're just a horrid, jealous, tight-lipped little pig. And me? You are. Standing between me and everything that I want in the world. Oh, Annette, please. Well, if you put it that way, I won't have anything to do with the elopement, mind you, but if Aunt Alicia comes to kiss you goodnight, I'll say you're asleep. I'll see that your elopement is not discovered till the morning. It was most begrudgingly that plain Annette consented to be a party to the plan. But her shrewd mind realized that the beautiful Amelia might one day find her a husband. Jealousy and envy fought with fright that she might indeed be an old maid. And Annette in the past had always lived in the reflected glory of Amelia's beauty and personality. Meanwhile, Louis de Franchi, as we know him now, was already leaving Toulon in a coach and was on his way to Paris to see Amelia, his beloved. Beside him sat his friend, Pierre Gaudet, and Louis talked excitedly as the horses thundered along the road towards the French capital. It seems an age since I've seen her, Pierre. But she's never been out of your mind. Never. And when she sees this letter, this filthy letter, it links her name with that of this captain. Oh, I'll find out who wrote it, Pierre, if it's the last thing I do. I wonder how your mother is, Louis. Whether there's any sign of your brother. I wonder. Have you ever thought what your brother might be like? In character, I mean. Of course, he's the image of you in features. Yes, I want to meet my brother as soon as possible. I feel somehow that he'll be the answer to my every question. Where I feel I'm lacking, he'll make up for it. And where he's lacking, perhaps I may help. I feel somehow that together we shall be strength, Lucian and I. And what about Amelie? Where will she fit into this family picture? She'll be one of the family, of course. A sister-in-law to Lucian, a wife to me. My wife. Oh, Pierre, how wonderful those words sound. What meaning they have when you know the woman who's to bear that name. My wife. My lovely, guileless, angelic wife. Amelia. if you only knew the thrill of sitting here in this room once again, seeing you there by the windows, watching the fire roaring in the hearth, and the table with the glass and silver. Supper will be most welcome after our long ride. You will look very tired, Lucien. <sighs> I am tired, but I'm happy. I think a brandy might help. It was really too long a ride for you. You are not well as yet. Well, well enough to escape. And that is all that matters. <laughs> no. I will pour you a brandy, and while you drink it, I will tell you a story, Lucia. I have told you that there was to be a surprise for you, a great surprise. Yes, Mother. I've been wondering. I thought perhaps that our visitor might have come back. Visitor? Uh, Monsieur Godet. Oh, yes. And Monsieur Godet, he did come back, Lucia. He brought someone with him. My brother, Louis? Yes. Oh, Lucia. It is uncanny, the likeness. When we thought that you were dead, when I stood here in this room, grief welling in my heart, Louis came, and every minute of the day I had to keep telling myself that it wasn't you. Is he a Franchi mother? Our blood could never fail us, my son. He has not had your rough upbringing. His are the ways of Parisian society. But he is a fine lad, gentler than you, but with noble thoughts. Where is he now? Gone back to Paris. He is very much in love, Lucien. In love? Yes. You wouldn't understand, perhaps, since there has never been a woman yet in your life. But he is completely wrapped up in a girl called Emilie Latouche. He talks of her all the time, never ceases thinking about her. And now, because someone has written an unpleasant letter, he has rushed off to Paris to defend her name. In love? But he will be back very soon. Oh, he is so anxious to meet you, Lucien. In love. What is the matter, Lucien? Is that all you can say? I've explained that he is in love, desperately in love with Mademoiselle Latouche. Perhaps we shall meet her, and then we can judge for ourselves. There is one extraordinary thing I have discovered, Lucien. There is an affinity between you. An affinity? Yes. 
It was through this bond of twins, this telepathic something between you, that I knew you were not dead. At the time you were stabbed, Louis received the same pain in Paris. Oh, Mother, you're joking. I don't joke about such things, my son. When I talked with him further, when I discovered that the history of your twin ancestors had not been repeated, that there had been no vision, I knew then that you were alive. That proves that we share our joys and our sorrows. Is that right, Mother? At times of great emotion, yes. Well, my son, I have talked long enough, and Maria will be waiting with the supper. I will go and call her and tell her that we are ready. And Griffo, Maria... Maria. We share our greatest joys, our greatest sorrows, our greatest emotions. Love. Love. Oh, Maria. Now, Annette, run to the door. Look in the other room. Oh, this police will never be packed. It's almost nine. Almost nine. And at nine o'clock, the carriage will be waiting on the other side of the street. My heart is beating so hard. Oh, and really, I feel that something frightful will happen. Don't do this thing. Please don't do it. My mind is made up, and my valise is packed. What is more, the carriage will be waiting. I will remember you, Annette, when it's all over. You have helped me so much. <laughs> Just fancy Papa wanting to come and say goodnight to me. You handled him perfectly. I could hardly find my voice with fright. I promise you a diamond pin from England. That will show my gratitude, darling. Now, quickly, put me my brushes and comb. Here they are. And the mirror. Oh, you never fit the mirror in. What is more, it might break. And if it broke, that would be bad luck. There could never be bad luck for me. Not with Captain Renault. Oh. Oh. See who it is. It's probably the housekeeper. Wanting to know about breakfast in the morning. With a room in such disorder, don't let her in whatever you do. All right. Good evening, Annette. No, he prayed for. Yes, Annette. You're surprised to see me. I... Oh. Oh, yes, very. I've come to see Amelie. But... But Amelie wasn't expecting you. No, and I haven't even paid my respects downstairs. However, it's such an urgent matter that I must see her at once. What is it about? It's private, Annette. Something very private and urgent. If you tell Amelia that I'm here. I am in Amelia's confidence. Is it about... about Captain Raynaud? Why, yes, Annette. How did you know? I know a great many things. Perhaps you'd better go and talk with Amelia herself. She is in there. Go inside. Who was it, Annette? Oh, dear, these shoes will never fit in this police. Who was it, Annette? The housekeeper? I said, who was... Oh. Oh. Amelie. You? Yes, Amelie. How did you get in here? I was told you were here. What are you doing? Who told you to come in here? Annette. What's the matter, Amelie? The tone of your voice, it's, it's almost as though I were an intruder. You had no right to come in here when... When I'm not ready to receive you. Oh, I'm sorry, Amelia. I told Annette that I had to see you urgently. I I can't see you now. I, I'm busy. You're busy? Packing a valise? Yes, I, I'm i going away to the country. And I'm glad I came as soon as I heard the news. What news? Something very unpleasant happened when I was in Corsica. That's what brought me back here, post haste. Oh, Amelia, before we talk, let me take you in my arms. I just want to know that you're near me, that everything's real, and that... Don't, don't, thing. don't. Uh, I'm in a hurry, Louis. Don't you understand? I'm in a hurry. I can't talk now. You'll have to write me. Write you? But I've come all the way from Corsica just to defend you, to find out who was responsible for this horrible implication. Implication? What implication? Uh, merely, somebody wrote me an anonymous letter, saying the wildest, the most fantastic things about you. I shall never rest until I find out who was responsible. What, what was said in the letter? This letter linked your name with a captain. A captain? Yes, Captain Chateau Renault. Have you heard the name? Have I heard the name? Well, why, yes, yes. You know the gentleman? 
Yes, I know him. Well, somebody's trying to make mischief. Somebody's saying that you betray more than a passing interest in him. And that I should be back here in case it's too late. A most horrible implication. So you come back? Yes, but not for that reason. Of course, Amelia. I trust you beyond all else. I've come back because I want to find out who was responsible and to thrash him within an inch of his life. I see. Well, you told me your news. Would you let me get on with my packing now? Amelia. Now, I'm sorry. Perhaps it's abrupt, but, but I'm in such a hurry. And people will be drawing up on the opposite side of the road shortly. People who are taking me to the country. Uh, goodbye, Louis. Amelia, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, for goodness sake, Louis. Why do you stare at me so reproachfully? Will you please leave me? Before you go, Louis. I think you may as well know that the people who are drawing up in the coach opposite happen to be really one person. Captain Chateau Renault. Annette! What is more, Amelia is not going to the country with him. She's going to the coast and thence to England. They are going to be married. Annette! You pig! You vixen! You... I don't you... care. I hate Captain Renault and you know it. This is my way of letting him know that he can't hurt people less fortunate than himself and get off scot-free. He may think I'm fat and he may think I'm ugly. But now at least he'll know that I'm not to be dealt lightly with. Amelia... Is this true? Yes. Really true? Every word of it. I can hardly believe it. Oh, no, this is a dream, a nightmare. In a few moments, I'll wake up. I'm in my bed. I'll, I'll say to myself, I went to bed last night, and during the night I had a horrible, a, a fearful dream. It's no dream. I'm sorry, Louis, it's the truth. But, but you love me. I know you do. How do you know? You've told me so a hundred times. Then let this be one of your lessons in life, Louis. Never believe a woman, even if she repeats herself a hundred and one times. I don't love you, and I never did. But you do! Oh, Amelia, otherwise how could you say what you said to me? I would have broken my engagement off several weeks ago if it hadn't been for Papa. For some reason or other, just dotes on you. As it is, well, uh, I'm going to marry a man. Don't! Don't talk like that! A man with fire, romance. It's exciting, unpredictable, unexpected. All the things I've ever wanted. But you, what are you? Just a lovesick swain who goes around with car fires and a mournful expression. Two days before I see you again. Twenty-four hours before I hear your lovely voice. Oh, you make me stick with your sugar candy phrases and your milky protestations. Don't say any more. Please don't say any more. There's nothing more to say. Now you know. All right, nine o'clock. He'll be on the opposite side of the road. I must go. I must go at once. Not a minute must I keep him waiting, not a minute. Emily, don't you talk to me, you sneak. I'll never forgive you for this, never. And as for you, Louis, you would never have made me happy, even if you had had your uncle's money. Goodbye. Grasping her valise, Emilia ran through the French windows, along the terrace, and down the steps which led into the garden. Soon she would be with the man of her choice, and even the fact that she might run into one of the servants held no fear for her now. Meanwhile, Louis stood in the centre of the rose-coloured boudoir, motionless, image-like, with Annette framed in the doorway. Both were staring at the French windows that a moment or two ago had framed the lovely but devastating Emilie Latouche. At last, the silence was broken. Monsieur. Monsieur. Yes? Monsieur, I hardly know what to say. I... It was I that sent you that letter. Yes. I felt that an injustice was about to be done. You were away in Corsica. This man was making violent love to Amelie. She was responding... It was horrible to me, and perhaps my motives were those of a, a resentful person. I, I wanted to hurt him because I knew that he loved Amelie. I wanted to stop him marrying her. In fact, even now, monsieur, it may not be too late, I can go downstairs and tell monsieur Latouche. It would make no difference to me, Annette. But why not? She doesn't love me. That's all that matters in my life. The one whom I held above all other women doesn't love me. She doesn't care whether I live or die. Don't grieve, monsieur. 
She's not worthy of you. Honestly, she isn't. Even when the engagement was announced, it was your money she thought of, and the chateau which was to be yours. Then when she heard you were disinherited... Monsieur, where are you going? Monsieur! Walking like a somnambulist down the wide stairway of the Latouche home, Louis entered the coach and sank down beside his friend, Gaudet. Gaudet could get no sense from him and was extremely puzzled. It was not until they reached home and he had been fortified with several brandies that Louis at last told his heartbroken story. Pierre listened in silence. And that's the last I saw of her, Pierre. Like a beautiful picture in a frame, valise in hand, standing by the French window. And those last words. And as for you, Louis, you would never have made me happy, even if you had had your uncle's money. Goodbye. I'm sorry, Louis. And yet I've been frightened right from the beginning. Why? Remember I told you it might be a mistake to love too much. Yes. I didn't heed you. Love may be confident, fearless, almost boastful. Now I see myself as I am. A miserable wreck of humanity. No feeling, no soul, no future. Now, now, don't talk like it's that. It's true. My whole world's been swept aside. Nothing remains but a void, a chasm of nothingness. I feel like a man who's walked over the end of the world. It'll pass, Louis. Time is a wonderful healer. Perhaps. Oh, Pierre, you've been awfully kind. Could I lie here in my room alone for a while? I I want to get things straight in my mind. Try to realize that this thing has happened. That the sun won't shine anymore. That I'll never hear music again. That Amelia has gone from my life forever. You'll get over it. You have the strength and the courage to fight. I just want to be alone with my thoughts. Of course, as you wish. But remember this, Louis. Your family... All have had courage. They've been fighters, all of them. That broken half of the sword that you always kept by you, remember? It was the only relic of the Defanchi family that ever came over with you from Corsica. You never knew what it was, but it's symbolic of your family. Fighters, all of them. It's part of the sword that was used to defend you when your father fought for you and your brother and your mother. Remember all those things. Yes, dear. I'll remember. I'll remember. Good night. <laughs> you must try and get some sleep. It's late. Striking twelve. Good night, Louis. And as for you, Louis, you would never have made me happy. A broken half of the sword. To Peter brought it over with me when she escaped from Corsica. I took it when I left my uncle's house. In one of these boxes. Which box? Which box? Even if you had had your uncle's money. Goodbye. Ah, the broken sword. The pointed blade. It did service for my father. It will do service for me as I drive it into my heart. After Louis de Franchi received the anonymous letter which tells him of his fiancée and Captain Renault. He hurries back to France, as he doesn't believe the letter and is anxious to find out who is responsible. He arrives at the Latouche home, just when Emilie is planning to elope with the captain, and Emilie tells him the truth. She is caustic and contemptuous, and her words deal him a shattering blow. Returning to Pierre Godet's apartments, he is like a man in a trance. All hope has left him, and he feels that life now will be an endless void. When Pierre leaves him to retire for the night, Louis searches amongst his belongings and finds the remaining half of his father's sword. Raising it above his head, he decides that he will kill himself. It's fitting that I should die this way. My father's sword. Life by a de Franchi. Death from that which belongs to a de Franchi. This broken sword has followed me from Corsica to France. Perhaps destiny has written its purpose. My life is already dead. 
This will but extinguish the physical. It was just here, above the heart, that I felt the pain. Pain which might have meant death to my brother Lucien. If my brother Lucien is alive, I wonder if he too will feel the pain which comes when this sword finds its way to my heart. Oh, even in the act of taking my own life, I fail miserably at the first attempt. This heart sword's made but a glancing blow. If once again I... I... Oh, Louis, I just came back to... Good heavens, what have you done? Louis. Louis. Leave me alone. Get out of this room. In heaven's name, give me that sword. You shan't take it. You shan't. Uh, you stabbed yourself. The blood. Stabbed myself. Stabbed myself, did you say? I tried to, Pierre, but even when I went to take my own life, I show myself to be what I merely said I was. A lovesick swain, carp-eyed, weak. If only this had been a full sword instead of a broken blade. No, Pierre, let me be. It's mine. It was meant that I should kill myself with that sword. Don't be a senseless fool. Sit down. Open your shirt. As you say, a glancing wound. I'm not a success at anything, am I? For the first time in your life and mine, I'm ashamed of you, Louis. You were Defranchi. Seek a way out like this. Don't you understand? She was my life, my all, and now she's gone. What have I to live for? What have you to live for? Why, Louis, have you forgotten that tall, proud woman in Corsica? The woman who bore you, who risked her life, spent her jewels to save your own life? The woman who sent you to France so that you could carry on the name de Franchi? And yet, for all her efforts, all her agonies, what do you do? You try to take your life with the broken half of your father's sword. A hero's sword. You should be ashamed to call yourself de Franchi. Don't say that. Is it that you're afraid? Afraid to fight for your mother? Good heavens, man. When the girl I loved died, I had nothing to fight for. Nothing. But you, you have a family, an ideal. You have enemies that must be beaten back. Enemies who perhaps have already killed your brother Lucian. Who knows? Oh, Pierre, I, I never realized. Of course there's my mother. And what would she think of me to die like this? I've got something to live for, something to fight for, and I never knew it. Oh, it, it's just the shock of tonight. The shock of seeing Amelia, hearing her mocking voice. When you worship her as I've worshipped... I know, my boy. I'm sorry I was harsh. I know your state of mind, but... Oh, please, for your own sake, clear that mind. What I've done has been a cowardly thing. But I'll prove to you, Pierre Godet, that I am not a coward. I'll go back to Corsica tomorrow. I'll learn to shoot. I'll learn to use a sword. I'll learn to ride. I'll learn all the secret byways and highways of the Corsican mountains. And then, sooner or later, I'll learn to kill the Gedici one by one. By heaven, Pierre, this sword is a sword of destiny. This stab I made was destiny's stab. It has made me find myself. Meanwhile, in Corsica, in the house of Dino Gedici, affairs had become almost normal once again. Dino had never quite got over the fact that his hated enemy, Lucien de Franchi, had escaped. And both he and Pietro were mystified as to the method of this escape. Marianne, quiet and strangely reserved, had very little to say. And her great dark eyes, constantly brooding, were a source of puzzlement to her uncle and father. Business takes these two brothers on their way to a yachtje, or a trade port, and we find them on the high road astride their horses, a hot summer sun now beating down across the Corsican mountains, a thick red dust trailing behind them where their horses' hoofs have disturbed the track. Eh, another three hours and we will be there. Yes. Eh, I like this break. To go down to a yachtje to receive our stores from France. It kills... When you speak of the word kill, it descends me to the north. The, the Frenchie? Yes. 
I can tell you, Pietro, that if the, the, the Franchi was ever in my power again, he would not be nursed back to help. You have not forgotten the misfortune. I will never be allowed to forget it. The humiliation of the explanation. Shall I ever forget telling our cousins, our two other brothers and their families? The looks on their faces. They despise me now. But I will put it right somehow. Somewhere. There is only one here to, to take the life of Lucien de Franchi. That means I must do it with my own two hands, with my dagger, even perhaps with my gun. You would never be so fortunate again. I am afraid not. He is a cunning devil. His cunningness was proved with the escape. Almost as if he'd walked through a locked door. It still puzzles me how that escape was made. There was a guard who didn't hear. There was a door and a gate apparently untouched, still locked. Uh, never mind, Dino. One of these days, perhaps luck will favor you. And if you take my advice, should Lucien de Franchi fall into your hands again, don't kill him outright. Carry out your original intention and put yourself at rights with the family. Flog him before them all. And then they will know that Dino Gadici is worthy of his name. There it is once again, Louis. A Yachio Harbor. Corsica, my new home. My old home. I came from here as a baby and I come back to fight and live and eventually to die. It will make your mother happy, proud. My mother is a noble woman. She needed me greatly, Pierre, but I left to rush off to Paris after a will of the wisp. She made me go and yet she needed me. Now I'll never leave her again. Look at those palms down by the quayside and the mountains behind. Why, dear, it's quite the loveliest island in the whole of the Mediterranean. <laughs> that sounds just like your brother. The fire that is his fire. Oh, madame will be overjoyed to see you, to hear you speak like this. Will it take long, Pierre? Long to learn to shoot and to ride as my brother does? Your brother? I wonder if he's alive now. Oh, he must be. Otherwise, well, what, what my mother said... A tradition in the family, Pierre. The vision? Yes, your mother believes in that. I do, too. The pain that was in your heart when your brother was stabbed. It was as though his physical pain was transmuted to you. And I actually tried to stab myself. Oh, that's part of my past. That was struck out, forgotten. I'm born as a new person now. Reborn to be my mother's son. Yeah, at last. I, I think we'll rain up here, Dino. A meal will be welcome. I've been thinking of a long, cool glass of wine for the last hour. When you come down from the mountains, you feel the heat by the water. Oh, look, Pietro. Yeah? Our cargo ship is in. See over there by the North Key? Yes, yeah. ah, so it is, yes. I think as soon as we've had our draft of wine, we should waste no time. If the crates are dumped on the quayside... We should have to provide the means of carrying them ourselves. But if we instruct the captain to have the goods delivered to the store, we can go through them at our leisure. Uh, good idea. Come, Dino, the wine. A moment. Hmm? Pietro, look. On the other side of the street, over by the public well. By all oh, that's wonderful. Lucien de Franchi. Lucien. And a stranger. A European. Quickly, down behind the horse. Take your hand from your gun. To shoot him in the city like this would be murder. You know the Corsican law. I can't believe our good fortune, Pietro. Lucien de Franchi in Ayaccio today. Tomorrow, sometime, he will leave. We will follow and take him. Even now, I cannot believe our good fortune. It's almost too good to be true. Lucien de Franchi here in Ayaccio. And he doesn't know that we're here. It means that we have the whip hand. Whatever happens, we mustn't be seen. Somehow or other, we'll have to separate those two. Look, they've stopped before the store. Whom do you suppose the other man is? Uh, perhaps some European who's come by the boat from Toulon. Someone who might be a friend of the de Franchi's. Hmm. How to separate them, that's the question. Corsican law states that we must not harm those who are not concerned in the vendetta. Nor can we strike in the town. It is only by ambush. Ambush or abduction. 
what you mean. You know the humiliation I've been through. I promised the rest of our family that the front she would be tied to a stake, clashed to death before their eyes. Instead, he escapes, and I'm made look like a buffoon. Some way, somehow, we must take him back to the south alive. Well, wouldn't it be better to wait in the mountains and shoot him dead? No. If we can get him alive... Keep still. Look over toward here. Keep well behind your horse. Look. Now they turn and go into the store. We shall have to be patient. Because if they don't separate, we can do nothing here in Ayaccio. But later in the mountains, if we could stampede one of the horses... Better now to wait and watch. Perhaps the two will separate here in the town. And if Lucien de Franchi is alone, if we can catch him unawares, perhaps club him and sling him over a horse and gallop away, all will be well. That's it, Louis. That's the material your mother would like. Black. Oh, she looks her best in black velvet. That beautiful rope of pearls she wears, a wonderful contrast. Black, a sign of mourning. It matches my mood, Pierre. Oh, Louis, now, now. I've tried to cheer you up all the way over. Please forget your black mood. Just remember that you're going home. I try. The present is so hard. Everything's black. Like this cloth which you think I should buy for my mother. To me, this week is the funeral cortege of my youth. What nonsense. I feel that suddenly I've become an old man. That my youth has been buried just as you see a man or a woman buried in Paris. The plume black horses drawing a hearse. The drivers all wearing black, with black cocked hats on their heads. With a troop of mourners and carriages. Uh, will you take this, sir? Yes, yes, wrap it up. Uh, certainly, sir. Before he comes back, let me entreat you, Louis. There is a future for you... Look at it this way. Try to realize that you had a lucky escape. Poor consolation. Nearly was my ideal, my future. Now there is no future. Only nothingness. But this is so different to your mood in Paris. You said you had something to fight for. My mother, my brother, the de Franchi, yes. Perhaps when we reach my home, I might shake off this depression, but... Oh, Pierre, I see her face everywhere. Not the frank, open face that I knew, but a face that mocks. Those last words of hers always ringing in my ears. You'd never have made me happy, even if you had had your uncle's money. Uh, you're powerful, sir, it's ready. Oh, thank you. I'll pay the man, Louis. Oh, let me. Oh, we can settle this later between us when we reach your mother's home. Here you are. Uh, this is the money, I believe. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Come along with me. Oh, so brilliant in the sunshine after the dimness in the shop. I haven't been very helpful, have I, Pierre? But I'll try. You've been awfully kind, even to the point of thinking for me, suggesting that I buy a present to take home to my mother. I understand that Lucien always did when he came to Ayaccio. That's why this will please her so much. Now, look here, Louis. What you really need is a good draught of wine. That might lift your spirits. As you say. What a beautiful place this is. I think in a few weeks you'll be a different person, Louis. A complete change of scene, living a new life amongst new people, and getting to know your mother. I wonder what's happened to my brother. Well, if your mother's words are true about the tradition of the family, he's safe. You would know. What is it between us, Pierre? Affinity? Telepathy? Thought transmission? What? There's so much in the cosmic that we don't understand, Louis. Perhaps, if Lucian has been spared and you get to know each other as brothers, you might be able to give a name to this, this link between the two of you. Oh, here's the end. Oh, a man serving behind the counter this time. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, wine for two. Uh, sweet wine in long glasses. Yes, sir. Louis, I've been thinking. So far, I've made no arrangements about horses. Uh, your wine, sir. Oh, thank you. Money. Thank you. We should make arrangements about the horses soon. We have a long journey before us. Yes. Ah, that wine's good. Practically all gone at one drive. <laughs> you were thirsty. Listen, Louis, I think I'd better go across to the livery stables and arrange about horses straight away. You look tired, drawn. Sit here at this table and I'll bring the horses back. Oh, let me come with you. Oh, there's no need for the two of us to go. Stay here. 
I won't be long. Order some more wine if you feel thirsty. It'll make you feel better. And it'll fortify you for that journey. All right, Pierre. Perhaps in my present mood, I'd best be by myself anyway. Pierre Godet hurried out of the gaily painted inn and across the sun-drenched street to the livery stables. But there he met with a check. At first, it seemed that a pack horse would not be available. Since Louis on this occasion had brought most of his belongings, it seemed that a pack horse would be most necessary. However, after a great deal of persuading and arguing, and after some money had been exchanged, Pierre finally found himself in possession of two hacks and a donkey for the pack. Leaving these from the other end of the street near the harbour to the inn, he secured all three animals to the tethering post by the door of the inn. Walking inside, he found the inn to be empty, except for the Corsican barman in his open silk shirt and black sash, who was now industriously polishing glasses behind the counter. Oh, uh, Barman, uh, my friend, where is he? Uh, I cannot tell you, sir. I arranged to meet him back here. Oh, I thought he'd gone to find you, sir. He ordered wine and more drink. They'd waited for half an hour or more, then walked up and down outside and, and finally crossed the road. I guessed that he'd gone to meet you halfway. Mm, I was much longer than I expected. I, I had difficulty in getting horses. Ah, mm, oh, horses. I'm a stranger here, monsieur. I have but lately bought this inn. I'm from Bonifacio. And my own horses, which I bought here with my goods and chattels... Oh, they were snapped up like that. Ah, yes. Horses are getting scarce. You were lucky, monsieur, to buy what you could. But where's my friend? That's the question. I, I didn't meet him on my way back. Indeed. And I thought your paths would have crossed. I think I'd better walk up the street. Oh, perhaps it would be better to stay here, sir. He will come back, surely. Uh, you're right, Barman. This is where I did arrange to meet him. <laughs> Very well, but I'd consider it a favour if you'd pour me another glass of wine. <laughs> I've been arguing for over an hour. Arguing over those horses out there. Dino! Yes? Pull up! Pull up! What's wrong? Ah, the body. It's slipping off the back of the pack horse. Just a moment. He hasn't recovered consciousness yet? No, it, he was slipping sideways over the pack horse. <laughs> that would never do to have him dragged along the mountain path. To have him dead before he got him home. <laughs> I can hardly believe our good fortune, Dino. To think that he walked right into our hat. It was so easy and so surprising. As a rule, all the Franchi that I've ever dealt with have always been on the alert. And for him to walk along the road, in amongst the trees of the brook and Ayakio. <laughs> Almost as though he were a tourist admiring its silver beauty. <laughs> I still can't believe our good fortune. This time we take no risks, Pietro. His hands, his arms, his entire body tightly bound up. Oh, I like Pietro, look. He's recovering consciousness. <laughs> the blow you dealt him was not so severe after all. Oh, oh. His eyes are open. Where am I? Can't you guess, Monsieur de Franchi? Who, who are you? Who am I? <laughs> you haven't recovered your senses yet. Who are you? What does this mean? I can't move. What does this all mean? Perhaps now you can see who I am. Eh, hey, Monsieur de Franchi? Who are you? Surely your memory is not as bad as that, considering it was less than a week when we last met. Less than a week? What are you talking about? I've never seen you before in my life. <laughs> you hear that, Pietro? <laughs> He's never seen me before. Oh, oh that's good, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Wait till we take you home, my friend. You will wish then that you'd never seen me before. And remember this, pig. This time we take no risks. You will be flayed alive with no time wasted. So you thought to escape, eh? How did you do it? How did you get out of the locked room? I don't know what you're talking about. Nah. Why this mock innocence? The game is up now, Defrancy. You can't escape your fate. It was meant that you should be flogged. And I can tell you now there'll be no nursing back to health and strength. No prevaricating. Where are you taking me? To our home. You'll be staked in front of the house and flogged until you're dead. You're crazy, both of you. I tell you, I'm not Lucien de Franchi. Not Lucien de Franchi? What do you take us for? Oops, thunderhead. You will not be Lucien de Franchi before the sun sets tomorrow evening. You will be but a shell of the former man, a cadaver. But before you die, you will suffer. It might interest you to know that I was humiliated because you escaped. Escaped? Then, then Lucien got away. 
I'm glad. Glad? Glad that he's been recaptured? I tell you, you've made a mistake. I've just come from France. You talk of my brother. Your brother? Ha! Since when has this myth been invented? Come, Pietro. Let us get in our way. There's no time to lose. This man escaped us. Now we take him back and tie him to the whipping post. Quickly, whip up your horse. And so the horses started on their journey once again. The Gadici whipping them up and up in a frenzy to reach their home in the south. For this was a frenzy. A frenzy nurtured by a frustrated bloodlust due to the escape. But which was now, unexpectedly, to be gratified, it seems. This de Franchi, whom they thought was Lucien, was their prisoner once again. Quickly, quickly to the whipping post as soon as possible. And this time, no mishaps. Through the thickly wooded valleys they picked their way. Ravines smelling of moss, green leaves, of rotting vegetation, of death and growth. Over the bony ridges, down precipitous slopes and across swiftly flowing rivers, and finally past the cascading waterfall which marked the spot where Lucian was to meet his mother on the night of the escape. Then up the side of the hill which led to the Gadici home. Marianne saw them coming. She was at her window when the spiral of dust showed a movement at the foot of the hill under the hot sun. Later, when they were closer, she saw that there were three horses. Her father and uncle rode two, that was plain. But the third... What was that sack-like object strapped to its back? A knife stab of fear almost stopped her heart. Then reassurance crushed the fear. A knife stab again. Reassurance. Fear. Reassurance. Fear. Hurriedly, she ran out of the room down the steps in desperate haste. Across to the gate, which she flung open as the horseman came up. Look, Dino. It is Marianne waiting at the gate for us. Marianne. Marianne. I saw you in the distance. You, you brought someone with you. Brought someone with us. Wait till you hear, Marianne. Wait till you hear. <laughs> will the family have to say? Now we'll find out who is incompetent, a blunderer, a fool to let the Franchi slip through his fingers. Go to Lucia, Marianne. Tell her to attend to your cousin from the other part of the valley. He'll be flogged at once. But what of the other brothers? We can't wait. We won't wait. Otherwise, the Franchi might slip through our fingers again, and that would never do to make the same mistake twice. He, he used to be flogged soon. Tonight, your cousins will be the witnesses. They will tell the rest of the family that our enemy has been flogged, the name of Gadici has been avenged, that the feud has been won for us. Marianne stood mutely by while Louis de Franchi was dragged from his horse, thrown into the coach house, and a heavy guard put outside. All through this operation, her eyes never met his, for fear she betray the terror that was in her heart. Meanwhile, in Ayaccio, Pierre Godet, frantic, since he had walked almost all through the town to every house down every street, came back to the inn. Why, Monsieur Godet, did you find your friend? No, Barman. And now I'm desperate. Something has happened to him, something very serious. But what could happen, monsieur? He was in very low spirits before he left Paris. He he tried to take his life. I fear that he might have done something very foolish. Oh, but monsieur, how could that happen? This town, somebody would know. A shot from a revolver. The finding of a body if he used a knife. I've searched and searched. You inquired of the police? Oh, yes, yes, they've been helping me. I think every tenant of every house in the street has been questioned. Did you go back to the boat, monsieur? Yes, and he's not there. At first, I thought he might have changed his mind and gone back to Paris. You see, his thoughts are with somebody in Paris at the present moment. The boy is not himself. Mm, It is a mystery, monsieur. Tell me exactly what happened after I left. I have already explained. He waited for a while, then went outside, walked up and down, and, and then walked away. Where to, I I do not know, because I was serving customers. But it seems impossible. 
to vanish into thin air like this? If one of the horses had gone, I could have understood. I would have said that he'd gone off riding by himself. Surely he wouldn't walk into the mountain. Very unlikely, monsieur. And on such a day as it was today, so hot, with summer upon us, almost too early in the year. I think I'd better go back to the police and find out if they can give me any news. Should he arrive, send him directly to the police station. Oh, you? but certainly, monsieur. I shall do exactly as you say. Not in his greatest flights of fancy as a novelist could Pierre Godet conceive that his friend Louis de Franchi was on this evening lying bound in a coach house in the south of Corsica. The hour is drawing towards midnight. And already a half moon pushes its way up over the rugged mountains. In the house, all are waiting for the Gadici cousins to arrive for the flogging. And Marianne, who has been sitting in her room, looking through the window down to the coach house, and wondering what goes on in the mind of the man within, finally comes to a decision. Flinging open the door, she walks down the stairs, tells the guards to stand outside, walks into the coach house and closes the door behind her. Her air is almost defiant. If my father comes, I will tell him that I've come to gloat. Well, why don't you say something? You know why I've come, Lucia. Who are you? It is all right. The guards can't hear. These doors are thick. Oh, Lucia, whatever happened? I don't know. To be quite candid, I'm still trying to piece it together. But first, let me tell you, I'm not Lucia. I tell you, nobody can hear us. Oh, my heart, what have you done? What have you done? That's it. What have I done? All I can remember is that I was in a yatsio waiting for my friend. I heard the sound of a brook through some trees. I walked through the trees and I, I just remember no more. Oh, please, please don't be upset. Not on my account. I'm not the man you think I am. Why do you talk so strangely? You're mistaking me for someone else. My brother. Your... Your brother? Yes, my brother, Lucy and Franchi. I am Louis. You see, Lucien is my twin brother. I've come from Paris, and it was only this morning that I was in a yacht sale that this happened. Your father must have mistaken me for my brother. Is this a game? It's no game. I, I assure you it's the truth. You have no brother. Well, it was not generally known. I was brought up in Paris. Now I've come over here to live with my family. At least, that was my intention. But now, well, I, I understand that the Gadici are our mortal enemies. What will happen to me? Will they really kill me? You have no brother. I know it's so hard to believe, but we're so very alike. When you came in, you you seemed friendly. Surprised me. I, I thought you must be a friend of my brother's. But now, why, what's the matter? So, you choose to forget. Forget what? You choose to forget that you professed your love for a Gadici, and that a Gadici professed her love for you. This is your way of showing me that a Gadici is not worthy of your love. You're mistaken if you still think that I'm Lucien. If I still think you're Lucien. What do you think I am, Lucien de Franchi? So you're not Lucien, eh? You're not Lucien. Very well. This is all the proof I need. What are you doing? What are you doing? <coughs> My shirt. So you are not Lucien de Franchi. You are not the man who was nursed back to health. The man who was stabbed where that bandage is now. Oh, if, if you'll let me explain, mademoiselle, this bandage, I, it, it happened in... Hold your tongue. I don't want to hear any more. So, I'm not good enough for you. And you choose to forget me. You choose to forget that night when I led you across the rose garden, through the gate to your horse. When you told me you would pray for the time when we should meet again. Pray every night of your life. Instead, you deny me, just as though I'd never existed. Take that... And that, and that you, you, you Franchi. Mademoiselle, And please. that is a mere nothing to what you will feel across your back within the next hour. Lash after lash after lash. And I shall be counting them, exulting in them, until your last breath of life is gone. That will show you what feelings I have for you. You can forget me so quickly because I'm a Gadici. I can not only forget you, I could witness your death. Mademoiselle, if you can control yourself, please... If you can listen to me, bear with me for just a moment. It seems that you're my brother's friend. No more. You're in love with Lucien and he with you. Please then, be happy in the thought that it is I who will die and not Lucien. You almost make me think that. But no, you're lying. Another trap to humiliate me, to torment me, to torture me. Because you know that I've loved you. 
How could anyone be as alike as you pretend you are? How could anyone speak with the same voice, look with those same eyes, be scarred with the same wound? You liar, you unspeakable, incredible liar. I'm glad that you'll die tonight. If it gives you any satisfaction, it's true that when you left, my thoughts were still with you. Always. Every moment of the day, and at night, too. I couldn't sleep because of the sadness in my heart. I was a Gadici, you were a Franchi. We could never be one. Then consolation came, in a dreamlike way. You and I together on a moonlit shore. Sunset. In the sky like beaten brass. In a moving sea with the same golden glow. The first star glittering in a deepening sky. And you and I standing against that sky. Your lips whispering in my ear. I love you. That was my dream that I knew would compensate for so much to lose in the real you. But now I know that even that is gone because you're not worth the dream. You are not worth even your own name as much as I hate it. If only you hadn't come back. If only you'd left me alone with my dream. Oh, you monster, I despise you. I hate you. You disgust me. Mademoiselle, this is tragic. Don't think these things of Lucien, please. If I were not bound, I'd go down on my knees. You'll go down on your knees, but you'll grovel when the lash bites deeply. That's how I feel now, Lucien de Franchi. You've killed my love because you've denied it. I am a Gadici. I am not good enough. Very well. We shall see who's strong enough. Hurrying from the coach house, Marianne left a dumbfounded Louis. Never in all his experience had he known such an outburst from any human being. How was he to know that here was the wrath of a woman who had felt that she had been scorned, the vials of a blasting hate which can be so easily born of love if it is denied? How could he know that Marianne felt that a defranchi was ignoring the past, ignoring the protestations of her love, pretending it had never happened? Marianne wasted no time and hurried at once to her father's private rooms. Dino was waiting there with his brother for the cousins who lived nearby when he heard an impatient tapping on the door. That'll be our cousins. Come in. Why, Marianne? How much longer do we have to wait? I beg your pardon. Mr. Franchi, when is he to be flogged? As soon as your cousins arrive. Well, need we wait? Why, the hurry, Marianne. Besides, we want witnesses to tell the rest of the family. Don't forget that your father received a great humiliation when the Franchi escaped on the last occasion. But it's almost 11 o'clock. Get it done soon, please, soon. Of course, Marianne, of course. You're upset, <laughs> excited, perhaps. Let me know when it's to be done. I shall be there, too. But of course. Who will use the lash? It should be the strongest servant in the household. One servant? We'll use three. Then let it be soon, please. This waiting, waiting for the clock to eke out the time. It's, it's almost unbearable. What extraordinary behavior. She's not herself. Yet it was the same in the de Franchi was here before, remember? Yes, of course. You've done your work well, Dino, bringing her up as you have, teaching her to hate the de Franchis from the time when she was first able to think. But tonight she's wild, astray, almost uncontrollable. I have reared a strange child, Pietro. A very strange child. Meanwhile, in the north of Corsica, in the house of Madame de Franchi, there is a contrasting atmosphere. Madame, sitting in a favorite chair in the long, gracious living room, was doing some needlework. Lucien had been sitting with her, but now had gone from the room. As her long, slender fingers worked over the linen and the thread, their movements became slower and slower. Her head began to nod, and then suddenly she heard her name. Madame de Franchi... Oh, oh, it is you, Grifo. Where is Lucien? Has he gone to bed? It's about Lucien that I've come to you, madame. Madame, have you noticed during the last few days Lucien has been behaving very strangely? Lucien has been very near death. He escaped by a miracle. And his spirits are high, that is all. But, madame, on the last two nights I've noticed that when the moon gleams, he leaves this room. 
It goes out in the garden and stands by the pool where the carp swim. And he looks up at the moon, madame, and his lips move. Perhaps he is praying, Griffo. Uh, at first, that is what I thought, madame. So tonight I, uh, I took a liberty, madame. I, I went into the garden after him. Madame, I've served your family all my life. And I'm concerned over Lucien, because I know that even though he seems happy, he's not himself. It was then that I heard what he said. And what did he say? The same words that he used when he ambushed Marianne Gadici in the pass at midnight. Like a pale blue mist. That's what he kept saying, madame. Your face is like a pale blue mist. Greffo, I like this not. Nor do I, madame. He has told us that Marianne Gadici set him free. Unfortunately, for that we are in her debt. But no, madame. It is only a debt that is settled. Because did not Lucien set Marianne free? Madame, surely the unthinkable could not have happened. You, you don't think that perhaps Lucien thinks of Marianne in a, well, in a tender way? No. How dare you say such words, Griffo? It is the moon. That's what it is, the moon. Uh, I don't understand you, madame. The, the moon, Yes. Is it? The moon does strange things, Griffo. You have lived in Corsica long enough to know that. Uh -huh. Take the dogs. Why do they always bay when the moon is full? The tide of the sea, drawn into the shore, drawn out again, and all through the magic of the moon. I, madame, I admit that, but can man be affected by the moon? There is no other explanation. Lucien has been brought up to hate the Gedici. For there are savages who dance in the moonlight. Witches do their work by the moon. Tales, legends, words, all come from the magic of the moon. Moonstruck. Moon mad. Moon mad. Ah, then perhaps the moon has woven its spell over Lucien. Perhaps, madame, its power over tides and animals and men hypnotizes Lucien. Oh, madame, he should not be out there, because such thoughts are unhealthy, madame. Why, why, if Lucien were to fall under the influence of this Marian Gadic... She is no less than a witch. But perhaps through the moon, madame, she is weaving a foul spell over him. Is he still in the garden? Aye, madame. I will call him into the house. Wait till I open the window. Look, madame... Look you. See? There in the pale light of the moon, you can see him now. Look. Down there, madame, by the brook. Lucia. Lucia. Yes, mother? Will you come up here? I want you, my son. I'm coming, mother. Griffo, make no mention of this. Lucia has been very ill. He has not the strength of body, the strength of mind to combat evil influences as yet. I understand, madame. I understand. Mm, it is well that you told me. We shall know now how to deal with this. Lucia must not be too much alone. Oh, there you are, Lucia. Come in, come in, my son, and talk. Griffo came to keep me company because I was here all alone. Were you, mother? And... You were in the garden all alone? Yes, I, I was. Oh, it's a beautiful night outside. Half moon. In such a light, the leaves of the trees look, look as though they were frosted. Mother, what work is this you're doing? Oh, some embroidery. Do you like it, my son? Oh, Mother, what patience. What patience you have. Roses. Oh, indeed, every petal. Leaves, even the veins. E oh. What is the matter? Oh. Lucien. Oh, Lucien, what is it? Oh, my back. In heaven's name, Lucien. Oh, the pain. Oh. Like a knife. Cutting across my back. Lucien, my son. Oh, don't come near me, please. If I grit my teeth. Oh, what is it? Oh. 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 Anna. Anna. I feel you weeping. Oh. 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 
Lucia. In heaven's name, what is the matter? Oh. Griffo, tear his coat off. Oh. His shirt. See, what is the matter? Oh, oh. Lucia, let me. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. Please, Lucia. No. Oh. Mother. I know what it is. It's Louis. Louis? Yes. It's Louis. Oh. He's in danger. Louis's being tortured. Tortured. <laughs> Oh, it is Louis. Louis is in danger. Oh. Oh. Louis. Yes. Something's happening to Louis. Oh. In Paris. He is in Paris, isn't he? Oh, you... You said he was. Yes, but what could happen? Oh, Griffo, oh. Griffo, what is to be done? Oh. Oh. Oh, my son, if there were only something I could do for you. Oh. Please let me take the coat from your bag. Oh, it would be no use, Mother. I must bear it. Oh. I only hope and pray that whatever happens to Louis, he can survive this pain. Oh. Where did Louis say he was going? I told you, Lucien, to Paris. Oh. Somebody had written an unpleasant letter about the girl he loved. Oh. Oh, Lucia, your face is contorted with pain. Oh. You are not listening. Griffo, oh. Griffo, help him to his feet. Oh, we will take him to his bed. Oh, come. Oh. Oh. Open the door, quickly. Oh. Oh. Oh, quickly, Griffo. Pull the covers back. Oh. No, my son. Gently. Oh. Gently. Oh, not on my back, please. To my face. I lie on my face, not my back. Oh, oh Lucia, what are they doing to Louis? Oh. What are they doing? We are in the oh. dark, madame. We don't oh. even know oh. who they can be. If, if Louis were in Corsica, I could understand, but in Paris, oh. He must have enemies in Paris. Somebody who is, who is torturing him as, oh... As I am being tortured now. Oh, Lucian, you have seen nothing. Oh, what do you mean? The tradition. The tradition of your twin ancestors. Oh. If anything happened to one, the other would know. Oh. He saw a vision of his brother when he died. I... Oh, I have seen nothing. All I feel is this pain, this pain. Oh. Oh, please leave me, Mother. Leave me here, please. I would rather rather be by myself. Oh, Mother, it cannot last much longer. Longer it cannot. Oh, is there any... No, go. Go, please. Go. I don't want you to see me like this. Oh, go. Go. Uh, yes, Lucy. Oh. Come, Griffo. Oh. Oh. Oh, madame, we are so helpless. Oh, no, Griffo. Listen to oh. Lucy. The pain he goes through. Oh, oh. What is happening to Louis? It is the lash of some kind, madame. Oh, oh madame, it must be serious. Oh. So very serious for Lucien to be in such pain. Oh. And if he sees the vision. You have heard the story, Griffo. Oh. The story of how the ancestor twin saw his brother. The brother was ambushed. The other twin oh. was in our own castle writing a letter. Oh. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. The twin, thinking that his brother had returned, went to the door and opened it. And there was his brother standing, bleeding. Then he vanished. But, madame, Lucien will know should anything happen. Of that I'm sure. (gasps) Crippo. Yes, madame. You heard. Aye, madame. The front door. Listen, Lucian has not heard. He is still in pain on his bed. Shall, shall we tell Lucian to open the door, madame? Again. Madame, it may be a visitor. A visitor? When it is nearly midnight? But Lucian has not heard, madame. He would have heard if... if, 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 if I will open the door myself. No, no, madame, no. I am not afraid. You can stay here, Griffo. No, madame. I go with you. Wherever you go, I go, madame. At last. Monsieur Godet. Monsieur Godet. At last. The lights were lit in the house. I wonder that you didn't answer. Tell me quickly. Is he here? Is he here? Lucien? No. Louis. Louis? Yes, madame. 
Tonight I've travelled along the road from Ayaccio. This is the only place that he could be. What are you talking about? Louis is not here. He's in Paris. He left here to go to Paris. And so did you. Yes, madame. We left. But events in Paris... Well, well, we came back. Oh, tell me quickly. Is he here? No. Oh. What is it? Tell me quickly, Monsieur Godet. We know that Louis is in danger. Dreadful danger. We know at this moment that he is being tortured. Tortured? Yes. Inside there, Louis, Lucian is in pain, in agony. Even now, you can hear his gasp. Even a moment. Not a sound. Madame, not a sound comes from his room. Quickly, quickly. Lucian, Lucian. Oh, don't tell me. No, no. A moment, madame, a moment. His heart. Let me listen. His his heart beats, madame. It is only faint, but it beats. And I believe my eyes. A repetition of what happened in Paris with Louis. When Lucien was stabbed, Louis fainted thus. Lucien isn't dead, madame. Uh, it is Lucien here. Yes. Then Louis has almost been done to death. Almost done to death. What can we do? What did the doctor do in Paris? We must revive Lucien. There's nothing we can do. The doctor said it was a trance-like condition. We must leave him here, madame. Leave him until he recovers. Oh. Come, madame. Poor madame. Poor oh. madame. Sit down here. Oh. Forgive me, Monsieur Coudet, for giving way like this. In spite of my tears, I have always prided myself that I am a brave woman. But when a mother knows that her son is being tortured somewhere, perhaps even might be dead. But Madame Lucien would have known. Yes, Griffo, but Lucia has fainted. Perhaps Lucia saw a vision of Louis in his room, and perhaps he was overcome. What is your story, Monsieur Godet? What has happened since we last saw you? It's a long story, madame. A very sad one. The woman your son loved has proved to be worthless. Oh, no. Not Mademoiselle Latouche. Yes. I, I feared for Louis, even at the beginning. You see, madame, he loved too much. His world was the beautiful Emilie Latouche. I have never met the Mademoiselle. But I felt that I knew her, Monsieur Godet. I felt that she was indeed one of the most beautiful, one of the most noble girls in Paris. Ah, madame, you had Louis' picture of this girl. But she's been incredibly heartless. She married another man. At least that was her intention when we left. Ah, poor Louis. Poor Louis. But what happened when you arrived in Igazio? Oh, madame, that is the mystery. We stepped off the boat. We went to the store where Louis bought you a present to bring home. And, <laughs> and then... Then... <laughs> why, madame, it was just as though the earth had swallowed him up. He... He disappeared. Disappeared? He disappeared completely. I left him at the inn while I went to arrange about the horses. When I went back, he'd gone. The innkeeper saw him walking up and down outside and... Well, that's the last that anyone in Ayaccio saw of him. But that is incredible. But where did he go? What happened to him? I know, madame. Can't you guess? Can't you guess, madame? The Gadici. The Gadici? I, madame, the Gadici have him. They're torturing him at this moment. That's why Lucien is suffering, madame. Oh, no. Didn't they threaten the flog Lucien to death? Wasn't that their idea to nurse him back to health so that they could flog him before the whole of the Gavici family? Oh, great thought. Then at this moment he is a prisoner in a mountain stronghold. He has been flogged. Now perhaps he might even be dead. Madame, only Lucien would know that. Lucien, who is now in a faint, lying here before us. Lucien, Lucien, come back to us, please. What have you seen? What made you lose your senses? Oh, Monsieur Godet, if you could have heard him a few minutes ago, gasps that came from him, just like the sound of a lash upon him. He was in torture. And oh, he... oh, hush, madame. 
Oh. He moves. He moves. Oh. Lucia. Lucia. Soon you will know, madame. If Lucien has seen his brother, all is up with him. It means, madame, that they flogged him to death. Oh. Lucia. Hmm? Who speaks? Lucia. Oh. Oh, it is you, mother. The pain. It has gone. The, the pain? What pain? Oh. Oh, yes, my back. Yes, mother. There is no pain now. And my head is clear. You lost your senses, Lucia. You have been lying here in a trance. Yes. Yes, Mother. Everything went black. Lucia, before you lost your senses, what did you see? Speak, Lucia. Tell us. What did you see? Madame feared that there might have been an apparition, Lucien. You have no pain across your back now, but you lost consciousness. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember now. The biting pains across my flesh. They went on and on until I felt I could bear them no more. And, and then... And then nothing. Mother, I must have fainted. And you saw nothing? Nothing. Thank God. My boy is alive. So... So Louis is here in Corsica? He disappeared in a yacht, That can mean only one thing. He is in the hands of the Gadici. It's as I feared. They were flogging him. I shared his pain with him. Mother, something must be done. What can be done? Your brother is in the south in the Gedici stronghold. With so many of them, what can we do, my boy? And in any case, Lucien, it would take you many hours to reach the south, and then it might be too late. But they may be torturing him. They may torture him for days. They told you what they had planned to do with me, to tie me up to the post and lash me until I was dead. What a strange affinity between you and your brother. At moments of the greatest physical pain, you both share. There is one hope. Perhaps that's why the lashing has stopped. One hope, and only one. What is that? Marianne Gadici. It was she who set me free. Don't speak of Marianne. Mother, I will. You owe her my life. They would surely have killed me. Perhaps now that the pain has gone from my back, it means that in some way, somehow... Marianne is helping my brother, Louis de Franchi. The de Franchi, how is he? Still unconscious. We didn't spare him, did we, Marianne? I will tell you the rest of the family that you have reinstated yourself, Dino. That is why you were brought here, Cousin Giuseppe. The first time you were brought in a mission which ended in disappointment. A bird escaped from his cage. This time, however... Giuseppe will tell them all. Both he and his wife, they saw what we saw. But there is still a final act, Giuseppe. As soon as Lucien de Franci revives, we will start again. And if he faints again? We shall flog him yet again until the last time. I doubt whether he will last the night. I've ordered three fresh men for the whipping. He tired three out. <laughs> He's plenty of stamina in spite of his wound of a fortnight ago... And Marianne, what is the matter? Nothing, nothing. Skull. I can speak your thought. You have a rankling hate for this man. Yes. I hate Lucien de Franchi. I hate him, I hate him. But let it be over soon, please. Let it be over soon. She's overwrought, you heavy. Of all our family, she hates the Franchi most. She has been brought up in that fashion. <laughs> As you rush out of the room, Marianne Gavici, there is hate in your heart. But only because the great emotion of hate is so close to that of love. You tenderly love Lucien de Franchi. And because you think that he refuses to recognize you, your pride is hurt. A hurt that digs deep down into the innermost recesses of your heart. You go to the courtyard where the body of the de Franchi is to be found tied... Arms outstretched to the whipping post, his head down, still in a swoon. You look at him, biting your lips hard until the blood runs. 
your eyes shrinking from the ugly red wheels across his back, some of which have drawn blood. Pity rushes up from your heart to your throat, almost choking you, and tears fill your eyes. But you fight desperately, thinking only of the fact that Lucy and the Franchi has tried to ignore what passed between you and he when he was last in your father's house. How are you to know that this man is not Lucien? How are you to know? Monsieur, he regains consciousness. Very well. Tell my father. Tell the others. Yes, ma'am. Well, Lucien de Franchi, has your vision cleared yet? I... I can just see you. Can you see me as I am this time? Can you see the Marianne whom you once held close in your arms? I... I never held you in my arms. So... You still deny that you once loved me. It proves that you never loved me. You led me on, seeking to humiliate me. Or perhaps to fool me into arranging your escape. I... I have no wish to humiliate you, mademoiselle. All I wish to do is to tell you that I am not Lucy and Franchi. You are determined that the past is to be wiped out. You are determined to say that this never happened between us. Why don't you be honest? Why don't you say that you never loved me? I don't love you, mademoiselle, because I'm not Lucien. Oh, you beast. Even when you know you're about to die, you still ignore the past. I'm very well. Father, father, he's conscious. You'll start again. Yeah, that is good. Here you go, Vanero. You take the whip first. Huh. So the, the French, she is conscious, eh? I hope you relish the pain that you already received. It's only a little, my friend, of what is to come. It is only a little of the centuries of humiliations and threats and bloodletting which has occurred between your family and mine in the past. Sit here, Giuseppe. You are a witness. You and your wife for the rest of the family. I hope you feel every stroke, Lucia. It will only be a little of the hurt you have done to others. But it will be compensation. Come then. <laughs> Lucia, Lucia. Oh, leave me alone. Oh, let me be. Oh. You see, Monsieur Godet, this is what happened just before oh. you came. Oh. oh, look at his face, contorted with pain. Oh, they're flogging him again, I know, I know. Oh, God in <gasps> heaven, help my son, Louis. Oh. Help him, I pray thee. Help oh. him. Madame, you must leave the room. Let me look after your son. Oh. I feel so helpless. Knowing that in the south there oh. are frightful things happening to my own flesh and blood. Oh. And that Lucian, too, has the same pain. Oh. Go into the living room. Stay there. It's better that I'm with your son. Oh. You suffer too much to see him as he is. Oh. Lucian. Oh. Lucian. Yes. Is there any hope for your brother? Oh. You were a prisoner. Oh, I... I told you... The only hope is Marianne. You see... Oh, Marianne loved me. Could she hold out against her father? Oh, that's the difficulty. Marianne is only the daughter. Dino Cadici is the head of the house. Then there's his brother to be considered, and the rest of them. Oh, they are probably all congregated in the courtyard, witnessing this flogging. Oh, that poor boy. If there were only something I could do. But we're all so helpless, all of us. Oh, so helpless. Oh. Hello, oh, everyone. Oh, is it that you grew tired? Uh, this lashing should be the last, Marianne. The last? Yes. He is going very pale. Pale? Harder! Pale! No! Oh, stop it, Renato! Stop it, I say! Give me that lash! No more, do you understand? No more! Marianne, what's the matter with you? He is not to be touched again. I can't stand it. I can't stand it any longer. Marianne, you old man, dear you. Your overwrought has been too much for you. I'll let Pietro take her to your room. No! Untie him. Will nobody untie him? Very well, I shall do it myself. Marianne, please! Be caught, knotted and knotted. Dumero, give me that knife. <coughs> now, take him to the room. The room by the rose garden. Just a moment. I think you're losing your senses, Marianne. This man is to die. This man is not to die. Marianne has not been herself to something. Please excuse her. 
This man's presence has unnerved her. You must go to your room, Marianne, and leave us to finish this work. I will not leave here until he's put to bed. I'm afraid, Marianne, I must insist. I refuse. To leave me only one cost, Marianne. You're not yourself. We shall have to use force. Bimelow, come here. They take Mademoiselle's left arm. I'll take the other. Let me go. Let I'm me go. sorry, but you leave me no other course. This man must die, Marianne. He's our mortal enemy. And it's something that we have all sworn to do to rid Corsican of the defense. Then there's only one thing left for me to do. Father, I must speak with you alone. Of course. Come with me through this gate to the other side of the wall. Put him back on the post, Demero. You will wait, Demero, until I've spoken with my father. Well, Marianne, I have not said much as yet. Your cousin Giuseppe was there. What he will say to the rest of the family, I don't know. But you should be ashamed of yourself. There's more to come. Lucien de Franchi must be released. He must be allowed to go back to his home. What? If you refuse, I shall tell Giuseppe. I shall tell every member of the family the reason. In other words, I shall make public the fact that I have brought dishonor to our name. Brought dishonor? But... But you... I thought I hated Lucien de Franchi because he spurned me. Because he refused to remember what was most precious in my life. That he held me close and told me that he loved me. Now I know that I shall never stop loving him. And if you don't set him free, I shall tell the whole of Corsica. <laughs> Gina stared aghast as Marianne spoke these words. Will she be able to save the life of the man whom she thinks is Lucien de Franchi? Make sure you hear the next thrilling episode of The Corsican Brothers. <laughs>